Hey everyone, I am Kieran Campbell and I did this presentation at the YMCA for a group of seniors. Um, it was really, really fun and I just kind of wanted to also share it with you guys too because they, they really enjoyed it and I thought it was really cool. Um, and just, just so you know, all of the information within this presentation is based on an article in Today's Dietitian which is a scientific-based publication written mainly by registered dietitians. Um, it was a really great article um, based all on the information I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, I do wanna give credit where credit is due, so I will also post the link to the article in the, the notes, okay? So thank you guys and let's uh, start the presentation. So the presentation is going to be on nutritional considerations as we age. My name is Kieran Campbell. I am a registered dietitian. I've been a registered dietitian for over 14 years now. I have experience in all different areas of healthcare. I've done long-term care. Uh, I currently work in a hospital in a clinical setting. I see inpatients. And I, I also took on the role recently of doing the cardiac rehab class, um, which is, has been really, really fun since I really like the whole cardiac health area of nutrition. Um, but I've also done outpatient education. That's what I started at doing, started out doing when I worked at the hospital. So, and in recent years, I've sort of tried to my entrepreneurial, uh, the realm of entrepreneurship. I have become a blogger. I started a website called Kieran Campbell Nutrition and opened my LLC. And I've also become a self-published author on Amazon. I have a heart health coloring book, which you can see on the screen, and also a heart health lifestyle blog book. Um, and I try to stay very active on social media. So you can watch me here on YouTube. I have a lot of recipes and other educational content. Um, and I try to stay active um, as well on Instagram. And then you can also find me on Pinterest, which is where I post most of my, my recipes. And Facebook, I have a Facebook group called Heart Healthy for Life. Anyone can join. And I'd love to see you and I'd love to follow you back. So that is a little bit about me. So what you're going to learn today, what I'm going to talk about is the health concerns to consider as we get older. I'll talk about malnutrition and the aging population uh, because it is a very, very serious issue that can lead to other things if we're not careful. I'll talk about healthy aging and the dietary, the specific dietary needs, um, both macronutrient wise and micronutrients uh, that we're, we need to consider as we get older. And then I will mention two very specific dietary patterns that have been proven to promote the healthy aging process. So first of all, I wanted to, to know for, I wanted to, to see if you guys knew that uh, people are, are living longer lives nowadays, but they're not necessarily healthier lives than their predecessors. And this is largely in part due to a person's ability to make positive or negative health-related choices throughout their lifetime. So how, what lifestyle choices, which I will go over, they, they have a big, huge impact. And that's the whole nature versus nurture debate. Yes, genetics play a role, but lifestyle factors, things that we have control over, make a humongous impact as well. Um, but yes, since uh, people aren't necessarily living healthier lives now than they were, there is still good news because, sorry, my kids are out there yelling and screaming, but there is good news. The things are, uh, and that is that we have things within our control. So some of the things we have within our control is our, the quality of our diet and what we put in our mouth. Also our level of physical activity, whether we practice in regular physical acti activity and exercise, and that includes um, both cardiovascular exercise and weight training exercise. We also have to maintain good hydration levels, drinking enough fluid, mainly water, tea, coffee, um, and staying away from the sugary beverages. Whether or not we 
have the bad habit of smoking. And when I say, well, I should have just put nicotine because um, it's really not only smoking, but also any, anything that contains nicotine or other carcinogens. So chewing tobacco, vaping, things like that as well count towards that. Also the amount of alcohol we consume and then the type of alcohol actually matters too because in diets like the Mediterranean diet, they include red wine in their diet, but it's drinking it with their meals and not in between or all day long. Also community matters, who you surround yourself with. So whether or not you're maintaining socialization, it brings about a feeling of happiness and community and belongingness. And that very much has a control over our health and our well-being and our happiness. So community does matter. Also levels of pollution in the area that you live in. And yeah, this might, might not be all within your control, but you do have a choice sometimes of where you have to live. Um, so that does play a, a part because we are, you know, we, we do have to breathe and we have to breathe in pollutants or, you know, we would rather much rather breathe in fresh, clean air than polluted air. So where we live does matter when it comes to the air quality. And then lastly, we do have somewhat control over our access to medical care. If you need to get a hold of the Department of Health and Human Services, um, if you can't don't have access to medical care or can't afford medical care, there are tons and tons of options out there. There are different plans of med Medicare, Medicaid. Um, so choose what's best for you and what fits your needs and contact any organizations for help if you need to, okay? So just a few things within our control. Now, what, what age is considered a senior nowadays? According to Feeding America and the 2020-2025 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, seniors are actually designated as adults that are age 60 or older. So this is also the age at which many community-based feeding programs begin. So an FYI, the number of seniors in the American population is expected to grow significantly. And by the year 2050, older adults are actually going to make up about a quarter of the population in most continents. I myself will be considered a senior by the year 2050, so I'll be within that group. So now I, I kind of want to talk about some of the specific health concerns that we need to be aware of as we get older. As we get older, the aging population is faced with unique health considerations. Our metabolic processes are altered. Our digestive functioning and digestive enzymes are more altered. Uh, for example, I see a lot of patients in the hospital that weren't previously lactose intolerant, but all of a sudden, as they get older, they have found themselves to become, they can't tolerate the lactose anymore or milk products. Just for example, also it gets a little bit harder to digest certain things like certain types of meat like beef. So um, that's just one thing that, uh, that changes. Another thing is your risk of developing non-communicable diseases or chronic diseases. Things like diabetes and heart disease and certain cancers and types of respiratory diseases. Our risk for these things just in general increases as with age as we get older. And also a nutrient deficient diet. If we don't eat very well, if we are leaving out certain food groups or specific nutrients, not getting enough of them on a daily basis, it could lead to cellular damage, including a lot of oxidative stress and inflammation within our bodies that can lead to other issues. So overall, I just kind of want you guys to get an idea that there are multiple barriers for the older population, which can impact their health and these barriers can be a little bit tricky to overcome, but with your healthcare team, that's why it's super, super important for everyone to be on the same page. And so you have a, the best plan of care for, for yourself. But, and by acknowledging that these barriers and acting proactively, we may be able to delay the physical decline that impacts our quality of life and our activities of daily living. I do want to touch a little bit about food insecurity and what is food insecurity? Food insecurity refers to the economic and social conditions that limit access to food, nu nutritious food, and sufficient amounts of food. 
and financial insecurity is actually one of the main causes of food insecurity. There are specific populations that are more likely to be food insecure, and those include African Americans and Hispanics, those with low socioeconomic status, people who rent, like apartments, and then people that are between the ages of 60 to 69. They're just for whatever reason, um, a lot of it is, some of it is socioeconomic status. Um, they're just more prone to being food insecure. But there are community-based food and nutrition programs that can help this population if they take advantage of that. So for uh, feeding, some of the feeding programs available, um, old, there's the Older Americans Titles 1 through Seven, the Nutrition Services Incentive Program, SNAP, which is formerly known as the Food Stamp Program, Commodity Supplemental Program, the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, Emergency Food Assistant Program, and the Child and Adult Care Food, food Program. So for more information on this, you can go to feedingamerica.org or talk to your local Department of Health and Human Services. I do wanna say that the feeding uh, programs mentioned. A lot of the eligibility for these services depends on a variety of factors, um, including age and your income level. Uh, advantages of these types of community-based programs include a general improvement in quality of life and decreases in falls and loneliness. So feeding programs are super, super important. And if you're eligible, why not take advantage of these things? Malnutrition in the aging population is also an area that we need to shed more light on. It's the prevalence has gone up, and I think that's because us as healthcare professionals are better trained at identifying it, which is wonderful. We need to continue those efforts and in order to reduce uh, malnutrition in this aging population. One of the biggest risk factors we face is malnutrition. Um, malnutrition is present in at least 22% of the population, and it can manifest in physical and mental bodily changes. So it can also make pre-existing chronic conditions worse, and it can act as a risk factor for other age-related changes. So some of the changes related to malnutrition include decreased bone and muscle mass, changes in your oral health, altered sense of taste and smell, reduced cognitive function, increased frailty, and social and emotional changes. So if you've noticed any of these things going on in your life, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're malnourished, but it's something to just be mindful of and mention it to your healthcare provider um, and just take those things seriously. So how, how do you know if you're mal malnourished? I don't expect you guys to really be able to identify uh, what a healthcare provider would, would do. Um, that's their job. But like I said, you can be mindful of these changes related to malnutrition that I mentioned before. Um, but malnutrition can be identified by a combination of the following criteria. Have you unintentionally lost greater than 5% of your body weight within the last six months. So keep an eye on your weights. See where you're at. See what you're, what's your, what do you normally weigh? Where do you, what do you weigh now? What did you weigh six months ago? Keep track of those things. Um, also, are you considered underweight? A clinically underweight person is considered having a body mass index or a BMI of under 18.5. But some people have been thin all their life. BMI is not the, the best indicator of health status. We all know that nowadays. Um, most of us don't know that nowadays. So I don't want you to completely, you know, solely rely on BMI. Um, but also, have you noticed a loss in your muscle mass? Um, has your dietary intake decreased or have you been eating less than 50% of what you normally eat for a while, for greater than two weeks? Do you have any chronic gastrointestinal conditions? Because if a lot of people who have GI conditions um, aren't able to completely either digest their food or and absorb the nutrients from their food. So it could lead to malnourishment the longer it goes on and doesn't get treated. Next section is the healthy aging and dietary needs. Um, ideally, a diverse and nutritionally dense diet 
is available and consumed beginning in childhood to promote positive health outcomes as a person grows and ages. But we all know that this isn't always the case for various reasons. So understanding the unique needs of the human body in different stages of life is crucial to aging resiliently. And I, the World Health Organization actually states that individualized education focused on diet and physical activity can positively impact health outcomes and is cost effective. So get with your registered dietitian. They can come up with a, a meal plan for you. They can pinpoint specific foods that you maybe need to incorporate more of in your diet, but that individualized nutrition education is super, super important to maintaining positive health um, throughout your lifespan. All right, so what does the research show about all what foods you should eat and shouldn't eat? Um, there is an association between all types of processed meat and red meat consumption and all co cause mortality. And for the most part, this is due to the composition of the meat. So meat is especially, you know, beef, things like that. Um, animal meats, period, and, or anything that's super processed, they have cholesterol. And all animal products have cholesterol, but they tend to also be high in sodium, nitrates, nitrites, and the type of fat also matters. They're usually generally high in a lot of saturated fats. Dairy products, on the other hand, had no association with mortality. They were kind of neutral. So nothing wrong with dairy. If you do happen to be, uh, you know, follow a dairy-free diet or, or lactose-free or have a milk allergy, then of course no dairy for you. But in general, research studies do show that dairy doesn't really have uh, that much of an impact on mortality specifically. Low to moderate consumption of seafood has been shown to decrease all-cause mortality. The recommended guideline is one serving of seafood daily. And this is due to the omega-3 fatty acids that they provide. And they also provide integrity to our cell membranes. And of course, which you probably all have guessed, the increased fruit and vegetable intake is associated with a decrease in mortality as well. So getting five to 10 servings a daily is recommended. They are very super high in antioxidants, fiber and various phyto, phytonutrients and phytochemicals uh, that can help decrease oxidation, oxidative stress and inflammation. I do also want to point out that older adults should not follow broad public health advice for younger healthy adults. This includes consuming low sugar and low fat um, items and eating an abundance of produce. I know that sounds crazy, but while fruits and vegetables certainly are important to your diet at, at any age, overconsumption of these types of food added to a you know possibly suppressed appetite as we get older, it might limit your overall protein and energy consumption and lead to unnecessary or unintended weight loss. So just something to be con considered, considerate of. I want to now go into the macronutrients and those would be protein, fats, and carbs. First up, I'm going to talk about the proteins. So the current protein recommendations for adults age 65 and older, um, these are just general recommendations. Obviously, if you have any special needs where you would need more or less protein, talk, you know, follow that recommendation instead from your healthcare provider. Um, but in general, with a good, uh, amount of protein per day for women is about 57 grams and for men it's about 67 grams and it's good to try to disperse your protein intake throughout the day to main, maintain your muscle mass and prevent muscle and strength loss so try to aim for about 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal so a good source of protein at every meal what are good sources of protein you can get protein from lean meats poultry like chicken and turkey, uh, eggs, seafood, dairy, fortified soy products, and legumes and beans. All very, very super good pro sources of protein. There are, and then we're, we'll talk about the fat. As your body ages, consuming primarily unsaturated fat can decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease, reduce inflammation, and maintain muscle mass. 
improve your insulin resistance and lower overall mortality risk. In general, you need to aim for less than 30% of your total daily calories from fat. Again, if you have any recommended guidelines from your physician about a specific daily fat recommendation, follow that one. But as a whole, try to get less than 30% of your total daily calories from fat. So this would be about 60 grams of fat daily if you're following a 2000 calorie diet and about 45 grams a day if you're following more of a 1500 calorie diet. So choose more of the mono and polyunsaturated fats. So those would be uh, the types of fat you would get from fatty fish, like salmon, tuna, mackerel, herring, sardines, your plant-based oils, um, olive oil and canola oil are amazing, olive oil in particular, nuts, seeds, and avocados. Those are very, very high in those good mono unsaturated fats. And then well, let's talk about carbohydrates. A diet rich in a variety of carbohydrates can help provide much needed energy for an aging population. That is the first, first place that we um, begin to break down our nutrients is we get carbohydrates, um, energy from our carbohydrates. So about 50% of your daily calories should come from carbohydrates. And of course, it's always best to choose whole grains over the more refined grains just to get more fiber. And it has um, all components of the actual grain it came from. So when you're choosing things like bread, um, look for the first ingredient to say 100% whole grain wheat or, you know, that's just one example. If you wanna know what 50% of your daily calories from carbs looks like, it's about 45 to 60 grams per meal for women and about 60 to 75 grams per meal for men. I know that your carbohydrate amounts are going to change also uh, depending on what conditions you have. If you have diabetes, maybe your healthcare provider wants you to follow lower or higher amounts um, or if you have hypoglycemia. So these are just rough estimates, just so you know. So good sources of carbohydrates are going to be your whole grains. So things like popcorn, brown rice, quinoa, oatmeal. There are carbohydrates in dairy products because all dairy has a carb called lactose. Your starchy vegetables, of course, are carby. So that, carby, so that would be potatoes, peas, corn, butternut squash, those types of vegetables. All types of fruit have carbs just because they have a natural sugar in them called fructose. And then also, even though they're good sources of protein, beans, peas, and legumes also have carbohydrates in them. So if you have diabetes, um, just be aware that those plant-based sources of protein are also um, containing carbohydrates. So you will have to count that towards your carb allowance. And then finally, we'll talk about fluid intake. Because like I said, hydration also matters as we get older. We have to prevent that dehydration. Um, a decrease in thirst actually does occur as we get older as well, putting us at an increased risk for that dehydration and issues with digestion and absorption. So in general, women should be consuming 2.7 liters of fluid per day and men need to consume about 3.7 liters of fluid per day. So this is about in cups, I know people are like, what? I can't visualize in my head what 2.7 and 3.7 liters is. So this is about 11 eight ounce cups for women and about 15 and a half eight ounce cups for men. I know that sounds like a lot. I, I don't even know if I drink that much in a day, but I, you know, do the best you can to prevent dehydration. And again, these are just rough estimates. If you have other health conditions like congestive heart failure, for example, you might have to follow a lower fluid recommendation just to prevent um, shortness of breath and fluid buildup. So what is considered a fluid? Um, fluids are anything that is liquid at room temperature. In general, fluids are considered water, sparkling water, coffee and tea, fruit, vegetable juice, milk, soda, any nutritional shakes you might drink, even the ice chips or ice cubes you put in beverages, um, anything, anything liquid. Let me take a drink here. Okay, so 
There are also such a thing as micronutrients. We talked about the macronutrients, the proteins, the carbs, and the fats. Now your micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. So there are physical micronutrient deficiencies. However, they are more difficult to identify than malnutrition. They're often only discovered through lab work. And some of the most common ones are iron, zinc, folic acid, calcium, vitamins B6, B12, C, and D. So those are the most common micronutrient deficiencies. I'm not going to go over all of these uh, micronutrient deficiencies, but I do want to take care uh, to mention some of these. Okay, so let's take a closer look at these nutrients. Physician supervised vitamin and mineral supplementation may be needed to stabilize your micronutrient levels. Studies on uh, micronutrient deficiencies show that vitamin D deficiency is actually the most common one with it being more common in women than men. But with any supplements that you end up taking, it's highly recommended that you talk to your doctor, pharmacist, dietitian, just to make sure you're taking the right form and the right dosage so um, it can really treat your deficiency and you're not over consuming or under consuming any of these micronutrients. So calcium, for example, you need to get 1,000 to 1,300 milligrams per day is what's recommended for those 60 and older. You can get these um, calcium in fortified cereals, plant-based milks, juices, yogurts, cheese, canned fish, and dark leafy greens. Then there's zinc. Women need three milligrams daily. Men need 4.2 milligrams daily. You can get zinc in from fish and seafood, meat, fortified, or enriched cereals. Then there's B12. You need 2.4 micrograms daily. Foods that you can that are rich in B12 are red meat, dairy, eggs, and fortified cereals. And then there's the vitamin D, depending where you live in the United States or, or the world. Uh, you might need more vitamin D there. I know I live in Michigan, which is an area of, you know, where we are from the equator, where in the winter time we get very, very little vitamin D. So a lot of the, the elderly, older population that I see right now in the hospital, we're checking their vitamin D levels and they're all low. Um, so you should get between 400 and 1000 I international units of vitamin D daily. The unfortunate thing about vitamin D is that there aren't a whole lot of good sources, but you can get vitamin D from fatty fish, from the yolk part of the egg, and from fortified foods and drinks. So lastly, let's talk about some certain dietary patterns that promote healthy aging. But before, before I mention those two, let's talk about what doesn't work. So as a whole, a lot of the um, Elderly adults uh, in America here eat very, very high amounts of fast food, red meat, and sweetened or refined grains. And for the most part, I think that's just because they're, these things are more convenient. Convenience foods, That this, this is where convenience foods fit in. They're quick to prepare. They're easy to prepare. They're um, a lot of comfort foods, I guess I want to say. Um, and they're, like I said, they're just convenient all, all around for this elderly population that doesn't have the time or um, a lot of energy to prepare food for and meals for themselves. So they also, at the same time, they're getting more of those types of things. They're getting low amounts of produce and whole foods. So they're not getting a whole lot of nutrients or as much many nutrients, and they're definitely not getting, uh, in general, as much fiber. So over time, this leads to a lower quality of life and cognitive decline because they're not getting the nutrients they they need to feed their brain and feed their body. So the first type of uh, dietary meal plan I want to talk about is a plant-based approach and you can call it plant-based, you can call it plant forward, you can call it, um, you don't have to call it vegan but it is very focused on plants. So incorporating more plant-based foods into your diet, it may help in preventing age-related cognitive decline. They're very, it's very rich in antioxidants, polyphenols, fiber, vitamins, and, and minerals. So you have to make sure that you're consuming a variety of, of proteins to prevent amino acid 
deficiency, but you can get uh, you can get a lot of amino acids from plant-based sources like um, beans, nuts, legumes, things like that. A primary example of a more plant-based approach is are the blue zones. I don't know if anyone has heard of the blue zone diet. There, there's books based on the blue zones. The blue zones are basically areas around the world, five five different areas. There's Sardinia, Italy, Okinawa, Japan, Ikaria, Greece, Nic the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, and there's one area in the United States, Loma Linda, California. So those are considered the, the five blue zones. And uh, what else is I gonna say about blue zones? Um, it's, it's very plant, for based, plant forward. And the blue zones are actually areas around the world that have the most centenarians. So people that live to the age of 100. They, they also practice a lot of uh, healthy lifestyle, lifestyle uh, factors as well. They stay active, they socialize, things like that. Um, the other one is the Nordic diet. The Nordic diet, and not, not a, I don't think a lot of people have heard of the Nordic diet. I'm not super familiar with it. Um, but as a whole, the Nordic diet is higher in omega-3 fatty acids, antioxidants, and fluids. And it does limit processed and refined foods. The Nordic diet is primarily composed of root vegetables and herbs, seaweed, high fiber fruits like berries, apples, pears, and peaches, whole grains, poultry, and fatty fish like salmon, herring, sardines, tuna, etc. And they mostly drink tea and water. So not a lot of sugary beverages, just very natural whole foods. Um, and I do want to say that the previous diet, that plant-based approach, they, um, they also have a lot of high fiber foods in there as well and whole grains and minimally processed and refined foods. So there, there are similarities between these two diets. And another one that I would like to, to add is the Mediterranean diet and even, even the DASH diet. They're, they're both very plant forward diets as well. So piecing this all together, um, I just want you guys to make positive health choices that can improve your quality of life and promote healthy aging. Just know that aging adults do need to be more mindful of bodily changes as we get older and those multiple barriers to maintaining good health. It helps to have a good healthcare team on your side, get referrals where you need to, get specialists involved where you need to because malnutrition is also a serious condition that impacts 22% of the aging population. And overall, uh, try to consume a variety of plant-based foods, lean proteins, dairy, whole grains, and limit your intake of processed and refined foods so you can protect against chronic disease and other age-related decline. So that was pretty much it, you guys. Thank you, thank you so, so much for watching and listening. If you have any questions on anything I went over in the presentation today, you're more than welcome to leave me a comment below. I will respond. So thanks again and have a great day.
Um, if you do have any questions, leave them in the comments below for me. I will respond to them and take care.